In this podcast, lawyers John Poiser and Solange Puisset share some extremely important information on the power of attorney document and the role of a power of attorney. If you've drafted a power of attorney agreement or if you've been appointed power of attorney, you need to listen to this presentation. We'll talk about the roles and responsibilities of the power of attorney, but we'll also talk about some of the problem areas that people can easily encounter if they do not fulfill this responsibility in an appropriate manner. So you'll enjoy this information that's chock full of great tips and ideas on the power of attorney document. Hope you enjoy the presentation. Well, it's a real pleasure to have both John Poiser and Solange Bouisset on the call today. And we were motivated to have this conversation because of the incredible turnout that we had at a recent Asante branch event. We ran Power of Attorney School, and uh, we had over 300 clients attend uh, that particular program, and we actually had to turn down registrations. So obviously it really hit an important nerve, an issue that many people are struggling with or at least want more information on. And that's not surprising, given the, d- the significant demographic changes going on in our society with an aging population, uh, ongoing concerns and issues around dementia, Alzheimer's, um, and seniors needing more and more support. It's obvious that the whole discussion of powers of attorney uh, are taking on more prominence as people are looking at whether they should take on the role, who should, they should give the role to, and what that role really entails. And so to get into the conversation, we're going to cover off some of the high points of this very, very important role. And sometimes being a power of attorney is sometimes like being appointed an executor. Um, incorrectly, sometimes people think that it's some sort of honor that's been bestowed on them. When reality, to be an executor or to be appointed power of attorney is a, a very large responsibility. And so, John, maybe I'll turn the call over to you and you can share with us a basic overview or introduction of the role and also stepping into that role, what that really means. Well, as a person uh, loses capacity, they need someone to help them. And that help extends to both help with financial decisions, writing checks and deciding to invest or not invest, and extends to personal decisions. Um, It's an important function in this society. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of uh, uh, demographics go around that. Sometimes stepping into that role can be uh, clearly demanded. And that might be uh, the case if there's a sudden stroke or uh, other event which happens bang, fast, and all of a sudden the people who are appointed have to step in and take over things. It can also happen on a slow and gradual basis, as might be the case where an individual uh, individual gradually slips through a disease like Alzheimer's and becomes less and less capable of making decisions. So the people around them have been, who, who are going to step in have to be sensitive to, to uh, um, the triggering event, whether it's uh, a point on a gradual continuum or whether it's a sudden event like a stroke, and be prepared to step in when the time comes. Interestingly, they're often asked, in see the Alzheimer's example, to step in before there's actual incapacity. They're, step, they're asked to step in and provide help and assistance along the way. And it becomes very unclear as to when they actually step into the role. Nevertheless, they have to deport themselves early in a very careful way to make sure they do a good job and avoid liability. And have you seen, John, you, we, I hear anecdotally, I'm, I'm not a lawyer so I don't get involved in these things, but uh, are you finding that sometimes people get them, themselves into to legal hot water or issues with CRA or other kinds of problems because they, they've taken on the role but maybe didn't handle things properly or the way they should have? Yeah. Um, once the, the, the person's incapacitated and once the uh, helper, whether it be an attorney under a power of attorney or a person appointed under a court order, once the helper steps into the role, it's a very demanding position to be in. The mm. courts expect the highest levels of care and competence by the person who's handling financial affairs for another. If they fail to file tax returns, they get in trouble and any penalties and interest of their own. If they fail to take steps to protect property, like uh, take out insurance on, on uh, property that can be insured against loss or put valuables in the safety deposit box or fail to get good investment advice. And if, as a result of those failures, some negative impact occurs, some loss or damage occurs, it's their own wallet which has to come out. They become personally liable because the courts are so very careful to impose the highest levels and highest demands of care on people who are trying to help someone who's lost their capacity. Yeah, so it's not a, a role, obviously, to be taken lightly. Uh, Solange, there, 
our do's and don'ts, I understand, around the, the role of power of attorney. And maybe you can share with us, I guess we'll start with the do's. What are some of the, the primary responsibilities that uh, we need to be attentive to to make sure we do the job well? So, Sean, the most important thing when acting as an attorney is to always act honestly and in good faith and to the best interest of the incapacitated person. So that means putting aside all your own, um, all, all your own, uh, any kind of benefit you, you may um, think you are entitled to uh, when acting in this cap capacity. It means uh, essentially acting selflessly um, for the benefit of that person. So the first thing you should do when you're named as power of attorney is to read the document that appoints you. It really um, sets out what your role is and what you are and are not able to do. Essentially, if it's not in the document, you can look at the Power of Attorney Act or the Trustees Act of Manitoba, but if it's not in there, you can't do it. Um, so it's very important to look at the document to see what you're permitted to do. Um, the document would also say whether you're acting alone as attorney or whether you're acting with someone else. And if you're acting with someone else, it's very important that you guys do act together. Um, all documents should be signed by uh, all of the attorneys named in the document uh, acting at the same time. Now when you're acting as, as attorney, you kind of have to look at um, what does the job entail. Essentially, when you start acting, what you should do is um, set out a list of all of the assets that you're managing, whether it's bank accounts, financial investments, real estate, um, all of those assets need to be accounted for. Uh, you need to find any income sources that might be coming in. So there's a number of them that would be coming in, such as the CPP, OAS, or maybe a pension. Um, the attorney should also look for um, income that should be coming in, but that isn't. So if um, the person is not receiving CPP and should be, then it's the attorney's role to then apply for the CPP benefits uh, to ensure that those keep coming in. Uh, the other third uh, important aspect there of, of the person's assets is uh, their liabilities and their obligations. So any debts that they have, any contracts that they've signed, things that they're required to do, it's important to know about those and to uh, be able to deal with them appropriately. So in, in making a list of all the assets, the income sources, the debts and obligations, uh, that kind of gives you the starting point of uh, where you're going and, and how to be able to manage the person's financial affairs. Um, on an ongoing basis, the most important thing is to keep very accurate financial records of everything going in, everything going out. Uh, if you make certain decisions, if you're able to write down why you've made certain decisions, if ever you think they might get, be contested, it's very important to do that and, and keep records, accurate records of what you're doing. Um, and Last but not least, um, if you're acting as attorney, it's very important to remember to file the person's income taxes. The income taxes are due uh, at the same time as any other person, and it's very important to uh, keep those up to date. Okay, perfect. Now, obviously the don'ts could be a flip of each of the items that you just discussed, but are there any specific don'ts that you wanted to sort of pay a particular mention or, or uh, attention to? Absolutely. There's... Um, Many mistakes that we see uh, happen, and, and the one thing to remember is when you're acting as attorney, you can't make decisions in the same way as you would uh, for your own assets. So you might be willing to take certain risks with your own money and with things that you have or make certain gifts, but once you're acting for someone else, you're no longer able to make those decisions. They're not yours to make. So some things that you should absolutely never do, uh, for example, is not to give any early inheritances, and that could mean making gifts uh, to people, um, starting distributing money, assets, things like that uh, of the uh, incapacitated person. It's never in their best interest to give away money or to lose money uh, or assets. Um, it's very important to note that giving away someone else's money um, can get you in a lot of hot water. The courts uh, could look at it, uh, they could order you as attorney to pay the money back, they could have you removed as attorney. In worst case scenario, there could be criminal charges. So it's very important never to give out um, money to beneficiaries early or to anyone else. Uh, the same applies with regards to your compensation. Unless the document specifically says that you're entitled to compensation, or unless a court 
um, determines an amount of compensation that's to be paid to you, you should not be taking any compensation um, unless the document provides for it. So very important. Uh, another thing you should never do is to make gifts. Now this kind of goes into with um, no early inheritances, but any gifts that you make. Now some gifts are not as clear as others. When you give a, a property, obviously that, that's a gift. But things like uh, allowing someone to reside in the house rent free, um, that can be considered a gift. As can uh, giving an interest free loan. So all examples of things that you really should not do. It's not in that best, per, uh, best interest of that the incapacitated person. And it's not something that you should be uh, doing. Um, another thing that, that uh, you can't do is take on a role that's a very personal role that the person may have had in the past. For example, if the person was a director of a company, you can't step into those shoes and then become the director of the company. Okay. Um, you can't uh, become a trustee of a trust if the person was managing a trust. Or um, if that person is named as a, an attorney under someone else's power of attorney, you do not become power of attorney for that person. You don't uh, take on that role. Really, your role is to manage the incapacitated person's financial affairs. And um, is usually uh, limited to that specifically. Um, Sean, another thing that, that we do see in practice is um, unintentional, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional um, changes to the incapacitated person's estate plan. And what does that mean? Well, an attorney can't change the person's will. They can't change the beneficiary designations on uh, insurance policies, re retirement plans, uh, tax free savings accounts, and things of that nature. Um, and they should always, always look at a person's will before they start disposing of property. The reason for that is you may, um, it may be in the person's interest to, for example, sell their home, but if you haven't looked in the will and didn't notice that the home was supposed to go to someone in particular, you may have just uh, completely changed that person's estate plan and may be um, liable to uh, the person that should have benefited from that property. It's a huge number of issues. Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. There are a huge number of issues. And essentially, if you're going to make a very big decision and you're not 100% sure that you should be making it, it's always advisable to uh, speak to a legal advisor uh, as to whether the decision you're making uh, makes sense, whether you can be found liable if um, uh, people are not happy with the decisions that you've made. Uh, and that could include family members. It could include uh, someone like the public tr uh, guardian and trustee of Manitoba. If anyone thinks that you're uh, abusing of your position, uh, you could find yourself in hot water. Hmm. I know that when uh, when you and John were covering some of these issues in the branch event, uh, you know we had almost three hours of content, and uh, nobody was nodding off. I mean, people were taking notes here, being <laughs> very very alert and I think some of the things that you just talked about people have inadvertently sort of stepped over some lines and I, I saw a few kind of deer caught in the in, in the headlight kind of looks uh, as people were reflecting on some of the things that they've they've done inadvertently and it was a great wake-up call I think for a lot of people now John Solange talked about some specific clauses in the power of attorney agreement itself and I, I kind of thought it's sort of a generic fairly simple agreement but I'm getting the sense that you can actually customize uh, a power of attorney to reflect specific intents or wishes. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. It's not uncommon if someone goes through a careful process with a client, or if a lawyer goes through a careful process with a client, to end up with a power of attorney that has uh, uh, custom clauses in it. And those custom clauses can open a lot of doors that would otherwise be closed. Um, one example of that is gifting. Normally, as we've heard, if a person loses capacity, anyone taking over their financial affairs is forbidden from making gifts. Gifts have to stop. Um, that changes if there's a very carefully drafted provision in the power of attorney itself which allows for it. So you could have a provision at this, uh, in a power of attorney that simply says, for example, 
that uh, my, the current pattern of making gifts at Christmas and when the grandchildren um, um, graduate each grade um, is to continue both before and after I'm incapacitated. And that simple clause would allow for a continuation of a, a small and pleasant gifting pattern. It's also possible for an individual who has, say, a disabled child to put a provision in saying, I've been taking care of this disabled child. I've been using my wallet freely to ensure that the disabled child has the best possible quality of life, buying jets tickets, taking, uh, sending them on vacation and the like. And should I become incapacitated, I want that pattern to continue. That's another clause which can sometimes be inserted on a custom basis to the power of attorney and one which serves the family well if it's there. As another example, sometimes we have individuals who are U.S. citizens, and as part of their estate plan, they're making regular and recurrent gifts in maximum amount to other family members, all in a bid to reduce the, their exposure, the gift maker's exposure to U.S. estate tax if they were to pass away. And the idea there is that a provision in the power of attorney can allow that pattern of gifting. And after the U.S. citizen loses their capacity, the attorneys continue to gift away $100,000 a year or some similar amount. And in doing that, they reduce exposure for the incapacitated U.S. citizen to gift tax downstream. Those are all provisions which deal with gifting and the various manif manifestations for gifting. It's also possible to have provisions inserted in the document that deal with remuneration. It can be as simple as a clause saying, pay my attorney $10,000 a year for each year they serve, or something along the lines of entitle them to reasonable remuneration on uh, uh, the consent and approval of all of my adult children, or give them remuneration on the basis of um, $200 an hour for all the time they expend handling my financial affairs. So remuneration is another area where um, a custom clause makes sense. Sometimes if an, if an individual is involved in that business, and that business is involved, is, is carried through several corporations, family corporations, we also see a provision customized into the power of attorney saying that the uh, attorneys are entitled to do uh, state freezes and share freezes and, and corporate reorganizations um, as required and as part of the general corporate strategy. All of those clauses, whether dealing with gifting or remuneration or dealing with uh, corporate structuring and restructuring, can be exceedingly valuable if they're there and are exceedingly difficult to work around if they're not there. With those provisions absent, the most of those actions, or uh, pretty well all of those, well all of those actions, are forbidden. And um, if uh, if if the family tries to fix it by going to court, what they'll discover is courts will typically say, no, we're not going to introduce on a statutory on a on a judicial basis. We're not going to introduce on a judicial basis the provisions you need because they're not in the best interests of the incapacitated person. Harkening back to the point Solange was making not in the best interest of the incapacitated person. And um, if the incapacitated person had wanted that sort of stuff, they should have put it in the power of attorney on a custom basis. Well, what a great, you know, it's a great illustration of, you know, you've got people walking into their bookstores or their hardware store or their drug store to get templated will planning and power of attorney kits. And if there was ever a strong argument for the importance of customizing these legal documents and working with your lawyer, um, I mean, that's a great example of why it's so important to, to seek legal advice and counsel. So thanks for that. Um, well, let's turn on to a, another topic, John, and this is the exciting topic of bookkeeping. But apparently, keeping accurate records, Solange had alluded to this, is an extremely important part of the role. Maybe you can allude to or provide further detail around the bookkeeping role. Well, the idea there is that an attorney or a committee under a court order Anyone handling financial affairs for a loved one is obliged to keep very careful, very accurate and complete financial records, and we call them the books. And the idea there is that they should, if they're doing the job right, be able to give a complete description of all of the assets that the incapacitated person owned at the onset of incapacity and all of the debts they had at the moment of incapacity. So firstly, they have to be able to give that snapshot a picture of the fin overall financial position of the incapacitated person at the moment that the attorney takes over, assets and liabilities. Next, as part of a proper accounting, they're obliged to have a, a detailed record of all amounts in and all amounts out. So if they were to buy an orthopedic pillow, they should have a record that later on can establish that they spent $32 on June 6th 
at Pillows R Us to purchase an orthopedic, orthopedic pillow. They should have the receipt, and they should have a uh, bank statement or other record indicating the money went out. And that's, uh, and that's for all amounts out and all amounts in. So for a receipt, like a pension payment, somewhere in their records it should be very clear that $2,912 was received on June 17th as a pension payment from the Teachers Retirement uh, Assurance Fund, TRAF, um, into the bank account. And, it's that, and, and again, it's every amount in and every amount out justified and substantiated by backup documents showing the date and giving the details. The idea is that periodically an attorney can be asked to report to the court or to other family members or to the beneficiaries of the ultimate estate. And when that occurs, they've got to be able to put on the table a line-by-line -line indication of where all the money went and where all the money came from. And if they're unable to do that, they're going to be asked to, to assemble that retroactively. And that retroactive assembly amounts to archaeology. It's exceedingly difficult. It's exceedingly expensive. And if they're unable to successfully do, do it, then the deficiencies are visited to, uh, against them. Damages can be awarded against them. If amounts can't be accounted for, the attorney, just through sloppy bookkeeping, can be forced to take out his wallet or her wallet and restore the money that, it, that can't be accounted for. Put it, you know, pay it back to the person who's incapacitated. Not because there's evidence that they stole it, but because there's no evidence that it was spent properly. So that's the daily accounting for amounts in and amounts out. The third thing they have to have, other than the opening statement, the daily accounting, the third thing they have to have is a closing inventory. And that would be a statement at once a year, typically once a year, of the assets that, and debts of the incapacitated person at the end of the annual accounting period. So those three pieces together, an opening statement, a statement of all amounts in and out, plus a closing statement at the end of the 12-month accounting period, form a proper set of books. And again, if, an, if a person isn't keeping that proper set of, uh, set of books as an attorney or as a committee, um, it's a real problem for them. It's a problem because they can be forced to assemble it. It's a problem because they can be forced to take out their own purse or wallet. Now, when you think of it, if, if a trust company or a professional was handling accounts for a, a disabled person, everyone would nod their head and say, that level of detail seems entirely appropriate. We would expect that kind of uh, attorney, a professional, uh, to be keeping those very detailed penny-by-penny -penny records. But come on, it's only mum, and it's just myself handling mums of financial affairs plus my two siblings who seem to be pretty cooperative. Do I really need to do all those uh, careful book entries and keep all those detailed records? And the answer is, candidly, yes. Ultimately, the public trustee could step in and demand those records. Ultimately, when mum or dad die, the beneficiaries of the state can demand those records. And there's no excuse, there's no rule that says that it's okay to relax and stop following the formalities just because it's a close member of the family and no trouble is expected on the horizon. If there is trouble, it's going to be visited on the hands of the you know, sloppy attorney who failed to keep those proper records. So, John, uh, we have people listening to what you just said who can barely keep their checkbook balanced, and they've been, <laughs> and they've been appointed power of attorney. Now, can you delegate the bookkeeping role without having that specific power in the power of attorney agreement? What are the mechanisms for people that are a little bit challenged around uh, proper bookkeeping? I think they can delegate the, uh, the bookkeeping role. I mean, they can't delegate the decision to buy the pillow or not buy the pillow unless right. the document itself provides for delegation. But once they've decided to buy the pillow, and once they have the receipt in their hand, they can throw it at a bookkeeper along with the bank statements and, uh, one, and, and meet with them briefly once a month to, to infill de details and delegate the actual day-to-day -day, uh, grunt work of keeping those books. But they can't delegate the actual discretionary content of the job on someone else. And again, that means they can't delegate whether to buy the pillow, but they can delegate some record-keeping after, the after they've made the decision to purchase the pillow. And that might be on a bookkeeper. Okay. They should also look at uh, software, because software can, is not really delegation, but software can make it a lot easier by having fields that have to be filled in. And some basic accounting software could be put in place, like Quicken or I don't know what, um, that might uh, provide them, prop them up a little bit by demanding that they insert dates, by demanding they in, uh, insert comments relating to the expenditure of the year receipt. So that's another way to be propped up. Okay. It's also possible under some circumstances to, uh, uh, to actually delegate 
a lot of the role to a professional organization like a trust company. They're often willing to step in and provide what they call agency services. And agency services is, amounts to helping the attorney do a good job by helping the attorney with a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, burden that's associated with that job. And again, the, the responsibility still is on the shoulders of the attorney to exercise discretion and make decisions. But the day-to-day -day duties can be delegated, support for those day-to-day -day duties can be delegated um, to a trust company and then, provide, and then approval can be provided and general direction can be provided and important decisions can be provided by the attorney. So that's another more expensive but highly effective way to gain, to get some support around the rule. Because as you pointed out, the rule is horribly demanding and often that support is a real godsend if, if it can be secured. Uh, in my early career in the financial services industry, I worked for a large, uh, large trust company and in the trust services department and a lot of the work we did was was uh, administration to assist power of attorneys because often they were appointed but then the kids uh, move away uh, mom or dad are still living in one city but most of the family are, are remote so we often were involved in helping um, with some of the administration attached to that role now we've talked about bookkeeping at a very practical level thanks john um solange i think you've got some insights or perspectives on the investing role there is a role for powers of attorney to make decisions on investing Maybe you can share some insights around that role. Absolutely, Sean. Um, essentially, uh, when you're dealing with investments and investing someone else's money, uh, the standard of care that you're required to uh, provide is different than the standard of care you would um, be expected to have on your own money. When it's your own money, you can do whatever you want with it. Any risk is yours. Um, when you're acting uh, for someone else, you need to act with prudence, discretion, intelligence, and administrating, uh, administering the other person's property. Now, what does that mean? It means that you need to deal with that person's money very carefully. And um, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, put it into a, an investment that has zero risk. It means that you have to balance um, the needs of the person with their financial affairs and uh, the risk that you would be willing, uh, that a normal person, a regular person of, of intelligence and discretion would be willing to take with that person's money. What that means is you're not going to take excessive risks and you're going to be careful to preserve that money for as long as you can for that person. So how do you do that? Now, the best way of ensuring that your financial, uh, your investment um, practices are appropriate is to have a written investment policy that is not speculative and that confirms with the general rule, the general rule of caring for that person's uh, money and investments um, in a way that a person with prudence, diligence, and uh, intelligence uh, would do it. So let's take um, uh, what should an investment policy look like? So your investment policy would set out uh, the assets and the type of investments that you want to set out, uh, you want to have in there. So if the person before they became incapacitated uh, had a very risky in, uh, investment uh, portfolio, you might want to restructure it to reduce the risk uh, while still ensuring that there's uh, appropriate income coming in uh, to care for that person. The opposite is also true. If the person is, has a very, very conservative portfolio, uh, which is uh, making very little um, income, uh, not really increasing in value. You might want to restructure it to ensure that it's making enough money so that it will support them uh, in the long term. Now, at the end of the day, the one thing to, to keep in mind is you have to be making decisions based on the person's needs and their situation. So every situation is the same. It's always advisable to discuss with an investment advisor as to the best way to invest the income. And uh, very important to remember that uh, it's not your money. You have to manage it differently. You have to um, keep in mind that it has to be managed in that person's best interest and that uh, in all likelihood there will be family members, friends, uh, 
wanting to make sure that it's pro appropriately managed. Now, that doesn't mean that if they tell you it needs to be managed one way or another that you have to do it. Absolutely not. What it means is you have to make uh, appropriate decisions based on that person's needs, and probably the best person to help you out with that is an investment advisor. Some great insights, Solange. So the investment policy statement literally is like a mini financial plan. So it, it aligns the, uh, the risk preferences, the return objectives, liquidity requirements, income requirements. It's a, it's a holistic document, correct? That's correct, John. And, and just as um, you would do for your own finances, you want to make sure that um, the incapacitated person's money lasts their li lifetime and is available for them um, when required. Okay, perfect. Thank you for those insights. Now we have the issue of reporting. We've, I guess, alluded, John, to the reporting aspects a little bit in the discussion on bookkeeping. Um, but when you talk about reporting requirements, what, what are those requirements uh, that the power of attorney has to look after? Uh, well, the idea there is that if the person serves under a power of attorney document, which of course is a document that the family member is signed saying, I appoint so-and-so, handle my financial affairs when the time comes. So if the person is making financial decision making decisions under that power of attorney document, then the reporting requirement is one of two possibilities. If the document specifically creates a reporting requirement, if the power of attorney document says, thou shalt report to my brother Al, and thou shalt do it once a year by providing him with a full statement, and if my brother Al isn't available, then thou shalt report to my sister Sally. That's one type of, um, that's one way to impose a reporting requirement under a power of attorney. That's legally binding. The attorney then has to comply with the requirement expressly written into the power of attorney document. Often, the power of attorney document does not include that express clause. And then the Manitoba Powers of Attorney Act kicks in, and it says that if there's no express clause written into the document, then there's an express provision superimposed into the document by the effect of the legislation. And that clause says that the attorney is obliged to appoint on a reasonable request annually to the nearest kin of the incapacitated person. And this only kicks in if the person is incapacitated. But if the person is incapacitated and the document is silent, then the statutory clause which is imposed says report to the nearest kin on an annual basis. And the nearest kin is defined. And if it's a husband who's incapacitated, the nearest kin is the wife. If there's no wife and the person has children, then the nearest kin is the children. If they have no children, then the nearest kin is a parent. If they have no parent, then the nearest kin is a brother or a sister, and so on. So there's a, uh, uh, basically an um, a, a order of priority, um, going from closest relatives farther out through the family tree to, to relatives who are less close. And, but, but, but in each instance, in each instance, there's a specific person who's appointed who is, who, uh, is the person who can demand uh, those reports and is the person who's entitled to those reports at law. Now, that's the way it works under a power of attorney. Um, under a court order, like a comiteeship, unless the court order, you know, the court order could say that they're to report regularly to a family member, the court order could say that. But typically what the court order says is that the court-ordered decision-maker, called a comity, a comity, is to report periodically back to the court itself. They're expected on a periodic basis, usually every three or four years, to go to court and do what's called passing accounts. And passing accounts is a process where they um, generate the detailed uh, financial books that I referred to earlier. They generate those in written form and they attach it to an affidavit an affidavit is sworn in, uh, under oath saying attached or a set of books. I, uh, the books are accurate and true, and that's exactly how I dealt with every penny that was received. That's exactly what the person owned at the beginning of the reporting period. That's exactly what the person owned at the end of the reporting period. And I seek the approval of the court relating to everything I've done. And then under those circumstances, th that affidavit is filed at the courthouse along with a request that the court pass those accounts, approve those accounts, review and approve those accounts. And the court will say that's well and good, but before we actually provide that review and approval, serve family members. And so the family members then get the detailed statements that, um, and, and that are attached to the affidavit. And then at the end of that, after interested parties like family members have been served, 
after the public trustee has been served, which is considered to always be an interested party in the passing of the council process, the court will look at it and say either these books are good, proceed, come back four years from now and report again. Or the court will say, oh no, no, this isn't right. The family have pointed out a few serious deficiencies here. You're not keeping proper books and records. You'll have to improve. And unless you can explain this one, this one, and this one, you're going to have to pay those money out of those monies out of your own pocket back into the uh, uh, bank account of the incapacitated person. So that's a committee. A committee is always subject to that um, passing of accounts process. But it's important to remember, and then that sounds like a horrible, terrible process, and a committee should... Mm-hmm. And the reporting process associated with it is horrible and onerous and scary. That's true. It's also important to remember that even with the power of attorney, even with the power of attorney, it doesn't cut the attorney free of the possibility of having to go through that scary and onerous court process. Because the court is always willing to, to force a passing of accounts. So even if it's a power of attorney, and even if the document says, report to friendly Uncle Al, Uncle Al is, uh, won't ask a lot of questions. Uncle Al won't even really care but all you have to do is report to friendly Uncle Al. Even in those circumstances where the power of attorney document would appear to absolve the attorney from that horrible demand from the passing of accounts process, the way the law works is that any interested person, any interested family member, the public trustee is an interested person, or any beneficiary of the estate after the, per- after the incapacitated person has passed away, any interested person can force a passing of accounts by simply applying to the court. So the power of attorney might say, a report to doddering Uncle Al, don't worry, he'll be nice. But if any family member believes that the attorney's doing a poor job, they can apply to court and say, we want a formal passing of accounts and drag the attorney into court, into that high-stress environment to produce the formal sworn accounting that I've just referred to under the passing of accounts process. So every individual assisting someone else with their financial affairs, whether it's under a power of attorney or under a court order, is under reporting requirements and can be called to the carpet at the courthouse by a judge and put through that highly uncomfortable process I just suggested. I suppose in a way that's the quote-unquote bad news. The good news is that so long as a person is keeping careful and scrupulous and accurate books in the manner I described, they have nothing to fear. So long as the person is adhering to all the do's that Solange just described and avoiding all the don'ts that she's described, a person has nothing to fear following the basic do's and don'ts and keeping those careful books and records um, defangs the reporting process and ensures that when the time comes, the attorney or the committee will get a pat on the back and a congratulations and have the gratitude of the family and the commendation of the court for what they've done. It's a demanding job, but not an impossible one. Mm-hmm. Well, Solange and John, we've covered a lot of really important issues as it relates to this role. And John, I know that you have... Um, you know, over the years, as you've worked with families, either helping them craft power of attorney agreements or getting themselves, helping them get out of messes maybe that inadvertently created for themselves, uh, you came to believe that it was really important that you create um, some tools that people can take advantage of um, to be more equipped, better equipped to fulfill this responsibility. And you ended up establishing something called Power of Attorney School. Maybe you could spend Uh, Just a a few minutes, uh, maybe sharing the motivations behind that and how Power of Attorney School works. Well, the idea is this, is that people used to come and sit in front of me and they would say, I'm in the role, I'm an attorney or I'm a committee, and I'm not sure whether I'm doing a good job or not. My siblings are making noises like they're unhappy with the way I'm doing it. And so what I'd like is to ask you a whole bunch of questions, Sean, and get a good feeling for the role. And I would typically sit down with someone for three hours. We might take a break for a day or two, and I might provide them with some supplemental advice. And the fee for that came to be $1,500. I would charge $1,500 in legal fees to a client who sat across the desk and needed that assistance. And it was valuable. They would, at the end of three hours, and maybe with a little bit of a follow-up appointment, they would say, I now understand my role. I understand where I've been making mistakes. I can fix them and um, I understand the things I can't do, and I now have a complete answer to the sibling who's complaining to me, and a strategy to, uh, to get through that problem. Now, I like that because I'm a lawyer, and lawyers like to be paid fees, and $1,500 is a pretty good fee. So there was no problem with that. But at the same time, I started to scratch my head and say that I seem to be repeating exactly the same canned speeches to, to many of the people who come and seek advice. I seem to be telling them, 
going through the same spiel about this is how you keep the books properly. The same spiel I spoke a few moments ago. And since I was giving that same spiel over and over again, you know, customized in some measure looking across the table at the person and looking at what they'd actually been doing. But since I was giving the same spiel over and over again, it struck me that, that it might make some sense from the perspective of the clients and from the perspective of the public to take all of this advice and reduce it to a series of modules, 40 minutes long each, you know, so eight modules, nine modules, 40 minutes long per, and put those up on a website and have and give people the opportunity to, to just go to the website and click on the modules and, and watch the speaker on the module and listen to the, the, the speaker. Always a lawyer. But the, the speakers are lawyers. But to watch the lawyer, listen to the lawyer, go through the, the, the necessary instruction on things like bookkeeping and investing and on the do's and on the don'ts and on stepping into the role and on getting paid for it and on getting out of trouble when they're in it. And so that's what we did. We started in Manitoba and we had... Two lawyers uh, spend four or five hours going through those, it turns out to be nine modules, and putting them all into the Internet. And then we went to Alberta, and we had uh, uh, two different lawyers, Alberta lawyers, spend the time putting those modules together and then putting them onto the Internet. And we just recently came back from Ontario, where we had two accomplished lawyers go through that same process, and we're now lo uploading that material into the Internet. And we're going to roll across Canada, province by province, putting lawyer um, um, education, education driven and provided by lawyers. So it's lawyer provided education on a province specific basis into the into matching modules, the same nine modules up on the internet. And the reason we're doing it province by province is because the rules in Ontario are not the same as the rules in Manitoba, and the rules in Manitoba are not the same as the rules in Alberta, and the rules in Alberta are not the same as the rules in BC. There are subtle but very real differences in terms of how you report and how you get paid and whether you report and to whom you report and even how you keep the, the, the investments properly in order. So there was no way to do this without doing it on a province-by-province -province basis. Mm -hmm. so that's exactly what we're doing. Now, the website's up and running at www.attorneyschool.ca, www.attorneyschool, all one word, dot .ca. And individuals can go there, and they can go there to learn their role. Or, candidly, if they believe that a, another family member is in the job and doing a poor job of it, they can go to that, uh, that, that, that uh, our website to find out the, what the proper role is and identify deficiencies, mistakes being made by the family members actually in the role. And I suppose, third, an individual who's in the role and is doing the job right but is taking flack from another family member, oh, why won't you give me $100,000? Dad would have given me $100,000. You have Dad's checkbook. You should give me $100,000. And when the attorney says, no, I can't, the attorney can either send that person to a, to, off to a lawyer, which is expensive and difficult, and no one wants to do that, or send that person to attorney school at the website and say, go to the module on the don'ts. You'll understand very quickly why I can't give you $100,000. So those are the roles that the website can provide. The other driving motivation for me and for the individuals I'm working with to put that website together was this, that for 20 years I did planning and for 20 years I helped uh, attorneys learn their job and learned how to do it right. And also more recently I decided that I would hang out my shingle and start litigating. And so after 20 years of helping people uh, learn how to do things right, I'm now in the business of going to court and punishing them for doing it wrong, <laughs> or I'm in the business of going to court and uh, defending them um, if, um, if, if that allegation's been made. And what I also realized is that while I like going to court and I like the, the, the huge fees we can make at court, that a lot of attorneys were getting into trouble, not just because, uh, well, not because they were bad, not because they wanted to be in trouble, not because they were trying to steal, but only because they didn't understand the rules. And I figured that if I put together that website, I'd protect a lot of people from the, the, the vicious onslaught of litigation, both prosecuting and defending. Um, and I was confident that there'd still be plenty of work. No matter how many people go to attorney school and learn how to do this right, there'll be a legion who continue to bumble along and do it wrong. And so my litigation practice will still thrive. <laughs> Thanks, John, so much. Um, and I think that uh, we'll also put a link to Power of Attorney School in the show notes for this podcast and also some other helpful resources that uh, have been referenced as we've gone through the conversation. 
Uh, Solange, John, thank you so much for uh, taking um, you know time out of your schedules. And I know you're both very, very busy, so we appreciate uh, you doing this with us today. It's a great resource. I know people will get excellent value from the conversation. Well, that concludes our conversation with lawyers John Poiser and Solange Boisset. I hope you found the information helpful. If you have additional questions on powers of attorney, estate planning, and overall wealth planning, be sure to contact your Asante Wealth Management Advisor.